it's time to start. It's uh, one minute past two. So I'm now officially starting this seminar. So welcome everybody. My name is Gustav Arrhenius. And uh, today uh, I have the pleasure that we're going to listen to Marcus Genti, Trends in Absolute Intergenerational Income Mobility. Marcus has uh, worked for a long time on uh, inequality, poverty, and uh, socioeconomic mobility, wealth inequality, uh, a lot, I think, in a cross-national perspective. And he's currently the director and at uh, for the Swedish Institute for Social Research, Sophie, and Professor of Economics at Stockholm University. Uh, and uh, he received his PhD in economics from Åbo Academy. Uh, and in 1993 on uh, essays on income distribution and poverty. Uh, so that, that you have had as a theme throughout your research. So the floor is, floor is yours. I'm looking very much forward to hear. Yeah, I, I should mention too that this paper is together with Jasper Reune, who is with us today too. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. And let's uh, this, um, joint work with Jesper. Um, and it's in a sense, it's not even hot off the presses. It's actually literally being readied, um, or it's, it's partially based on a report, which is to appear by the Swedish Economic Policy Council this, this month, a couple of weeks from now. Um, so it's, uh, as one politely tends to try to excuse the fact that research isn't quite in place yet, this is a work in progress. Um, the Swedish Economic Policy Council has provided, or, or members rather of the council, have provided helpful comments along the way, uh, which Jesper and I are both grateful for. And we should specifically mention two wonderful um, persons at Statistics Sweden, Håkan Schultz and Johanna Frodell, without whose creative um, help in, in multiple instances, um, in, in fact, um, allowed us to acquire the data that, that we're relying on on here. So I, I, I really, almost certainly not listening to this now, but, but without their help, things would look. Uh, so this is by and large the structure of what I'm gonna say. I'll um, say a little bit by way of introduction, then I'll talk about the data and I'll try to anchor what I'm about to say in, in um, quite briefly in, in the inequality developments in Sweden um, across time. Then I'll say a little bit about relative mobility, um, after which I'll dive into um, our results on, on absolute mobility. And then I'll move on, um, hopefully time permitting, um, to talk a little bit about the welfare implications of which I thought I'd be saying a lot more, but, but I'll, I'll kind of, I'll, I do want to have time to, to do a little bit of that and then I'll, I'll um, offer some concluding comments. Now, by way of introduction, the um, family background and its importance uh, for social and econo economic status is something which for which there's a lot of, of both public interest and social scientific interest. Um, I was struck, I started, became very interested in, in, in this topic in, in the early 1990s when I was a visiting graduate student um, at the University of Michigan. And uh, Gary Solon, um, who's who I did know worked on these issues, had, had written a paper which was published in the American Economic Review at the same time as another paper on, on, on essentially the same topic. Um, and, and this Gary's paper was, was on, on the front page of New York Times, which I think really attests to the fact that this is, uh, this is of interest. And, and this was not the last time these, um, questions appear um, so prominently in, in public discussion. This is something on which uh, many politicians express um, a, a great interest. And, and of course, this is a, an important area of research in both sociology and, and economics. Um, this is in part driven by 
it should po probably be in 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 some kind of inverted commas ethical interest because I I, I think the ethics of this is 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 a hugely in, interesting but but much more complicated topic than than most of us think but 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 it it kind of boils down to this if if family group background is very important um, for the distribution of of either social or economic positions or both um, this may signal a, a, a lack of openness and it's possibly associated with inequality of opportunity. Um, the different questions here, family backgrounds, importance, inequality of opportunity, um, and also cross-sexual inequality, as, as well as more generally social justice, um, raise very complicated questions, which it would be interesting to explore, but, but they won't be addressed here. And in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna talk about inequality of opportunity at all here. Um, um, unless somebody raises it as, as, as a discussion point, because I, I think, again, uh, the relationship between um, inequality of opportunity on the one hand and intergenerational mobility on the other hand is, is, is reasonably uh, complicated, although there is, is a connection. I'm also not going to be concerned with, with either the underlying economic theory of these things, uh, nor issues of causality. Um, these are also of, of interest, but, but again, they're for another time. What I do want to do, um, rather than listing what I'm not going to do, is, is to present results about uh, intergenerational income mobility, in particular, uh, what many people call absolute intergenerational income mobility and highlight what I think um, are not necessarily shortcomings, but shall we say complications um, with um, the approach itself, um, having to do perhaps you might say with, with indeterminacy or, or, or something along those lines. You can judge for yourselves at the end of this. And the background here, is, as, as I already alluded to, is is a report that that Jesper and I um, have written for the Swedish Economic Policy Council at at their request um, this spring, which will be published in a couple of weeks time. That's that's in Swedish. We we intend to work quite a bit on on Marcus, this. So, yes, can you quickly say something why why you're looking at income mobility and not about wealth mobility? Uh, well, or maybe we'll get to that. Yeah, 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 I mean, in, in, in part, the answer to that is that that like, like the drunkard who's looking for the keys <laughs> okay. under the under the lamp post, um, we we have a lot of information about income, but but not not very much about wealth. Um, I have in fact quite recently done a little bit on on wealth um, as well. I did did a presentation for. A, for a conference last fall. The, the chief problem is that, that after 2006, there's, um, for, for these purposes, the only available wealth information in, in, in Sweden is, or the, the main available wealth information in, in Sweden is, is uh, based on registers and those end in 2006 when, when wealth taxation um, was abolished. And, and wealth from registers is, is not, an, an entirely unproblematic characteristic. The distribution of wealth is very tricky to work with. And for, for, for the vast majority of us, um, the main piece of wealth we have is, 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 is where we live. Um, I think that's um, essentially that, that's the, what, what the median person owns. And, and those are undervalued by a tremendous amount in, in the registers. That's a problem that can be fixed, but 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 not 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 in the data we have. So so essentially we were looking at income here because that's what we were asked to do. Um, I, I but but I will emphasize that I think studying wealth is is very very complicated. And and in fact I've only studied wealth during my career when I've specifically be, been asked to look at it because because its distribution is is so complex. Um. um I can't now remember what we. Well, what I had to say about wealth, but, but there, there are some recent papers on, on intergenerational issues in wealth. There's one by 
uh, by a colleague at Stockholm University, which in fact is very good, where he makes very good use of of the registered data that's available on, on wealth. But but by and large, I think for the for wealth inequality, we actually need good survey data to to get places. But for income uh, registers, in fact, provide a more reliable measure, which is one of the reasons why I'm I'm mainly working on on income. Um, but th th this can be the, the wealth or income issue. I think can be discussed at, at, at length, um, but, uh, but we, we may want to get back to that towards the end of, of the talk. Now, the, before I get in, in, into some other things, I, I want to, in a sense, ground why I think uh, these issues are more complicated than they look at, at their face. The, this is a, a, a quotation from a, a review of income mobility I wrote um, together with Stephen Jenkins some years ago. And on, on the empirical uh, thing, what, what we write is that, that any study of income mobility um, must settle three so-called W issues, the mobility of what, among whom, and when. And then for trends, um, there's at least one additional issue, which is comparability. Um, so the, the, these questions are what, which income concept should we, should be used to measure economic living standards? And in fact, the, I, I'm, I'm sidestepping the issue of, of should it be wealth or, or say consumption, which I think a reasonable case also can be made for. But, but even if you choose to look at income, you need to be specific about what exactly it is you mean by income. And we'll see that, that, that in fact, this matters hugely. Um, whom? Who, who are the children and who are the parents? And what kinds of circumstances should be uh, taken into account? Is it personal income, personal wealth, personal consumption? Or should we look at uh, the living standard of, of the units within which a person resides, which we normally think a person, um, uh, where, where we think some kind of sharing is, is taking place, the family or, or the household? And also when? Um, timing issues are important. What's the appropriate interval um, within which incomes should be measured? Is it is it a month? Is it a week? Um, is it a year? That's uh, very that's a standard choice. Uh, but but many economists think it's too short. Is it the lifetime, um, or is it some multi-year average? Um, if it's not the entire lifetime, um, then you have to look at some age. Um, uh, should it be the same age for parents and children, or should it be, um, um, for some reason I've deleted the end of the last sentence there, but, but should it be um, parental income when the offspring are actually growing up in a household, or should it be the same age for offspring and parents? So these things all need to be settled. There's no single correct choice uh, in here. Now, we'd argue... Um, that the ideal answers to these questions, um, that there's no uh, ideal set of answers, but, but the ideal questions depend, the ideal answers depend on what question exactly is it that you're asking. Um, and in particular, for instance, on this last point, when should parental incomes be measured? Um, if we're not asking a causal question of, of say, how do variations in the resources available um, to children when they're growing up affect how their income turns out? Um, if that's the question you're asking, of course, you should be measuring income when, when you're actually observing the children living with their parents. Um, on the other hand, if the, the question is um, taking some kind of stable indicator or of um, lifetime living standards um, and mobility in that, then of course that has different implications for when you should be um, measuring income. And the ideal answers may be quite different from what you actually can do given the data at hand. Um, now, so the question we're looking at um, is uh, something along the following lines. Are children economically... Yes. Yeah. 
so parental income, uh, or you will say more about that, is that uh, the average of the two parents, if there are two parents? or I'll, I'll say a lot more about that oh, okay. in, in a minute. Um, it, depend, it, it, it turns out that, that um, what you conclude is going to be hugely dependent on, on how you answer that question. Um, so, so, so the question in general terms is, are children economically better off uh, than their parents? Um, so what, what we're going to do to try to answer that question, or at least highlight, um, in, a, in a sense, if, if characterize a set of answers to that question, um, is to at least implicitly take as a point of departure the way in which living standards are measured in income distribution research. Um, ideally, we'd claim to use a concept that in Sweden is, is often called an economic standard, economic standard. We're focusing on income rather than other resource concepts, but that doesn't actually nail down all that much. But, but importantly, um, if references to overall distribution of, of economic well-being, as it's very often used in both um, social science and also in public discourse, then we think um, we want to emphasize disposable household income, adjusting um, for household needs. I'll say a little bit more about that. But there may be other questions one wants to ask also. And uh, depending on what that, what, what, what the specific question is, the, the focus may need to be different. I'll, I'll try to give some examples um, in a minute. But, but, I, but in, a, in a sense, our approach to this is, is to try to come as close as possible um, to the kinds of things we look at when we're looking at, at overall income inequality. Um, there is a substantial literature and social science on these issues. I'm somewhat immodestly now citing myself. I probably should apologize for that. But um, an early review of intergenerational relative income mobility um, appeared in 2002, written by Gary, Gary Solon. That's in the Handbook of, of Labor Economics. Um, together with Stephen Jenkins, uh, we reviewed the relative um, literature in, 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 in the context of, of income mobility research in, in 2015. And I've done a lot of both research and reviewing together with Anders Björklund, a colleague at, at Sophie, um, in a paper we published last year in, in, in a sociological journal, we um, discussed different approaches to measuring the importance of family background, one of which is intergenerational mobility. Now, in, in the past few years, there's been an upsurge in, in research on absolute mobility. Um, a prominent example of this was um, published in, in, in Science in, in 2017, by Raj Chetty and, and um, co-authors. Raj Chetty and has, has written a, a substantial number of papers on, on this topic in the past five years or so. There's also a, a quite recent uh, comparative paper, which um, appears in, in several working paper series. It hasn't been published yet by, by Manduka and, and, and multiple co-authors, in, including um, um, both uh, writers from Finland and and from Sweden um, um, in, in 2020. Um, I'm not going to review the literature on these things. I'm going to focus on what we've done in, in, in Sweden. I think you, you'll probably understand why I think looking at, at for instance, cross-national patterns, um, it, it may be premature to do so at, at, at this point. Um, I, I, I do want to acknowledge very clearly that when you're talking about intergenerational mobility, um, economics is uh, a latecomer to that literature. There's a, there's a large, um, in my mind, very, very deep and hugely insightful literature and sociology um, that looks both within and across countries on intergenerational mobility, often in terms of, of occupation-based class, class measures 
uh, often also in terms of educational attainment, an area where, in fact, sociology and economics overlap. And it's, it's difficult to know even where to start pointing readers. But, but one of my a formative experience for myself when I started working on intergenerational mobility was the, um, was the impressive book written by my colleague at Sophie, Robert Eriksson, and, and um, John Goldthorpe, um, from Oxford University called The Constant Flux, published in 1992. It's, it's well worth uh, reading still. Um, but but I, I, I won't say much more uh, about that, um, but, but, but I do want to acknowledge um, this big, vast literature, which has also led, I think, to, to some reasonably insightful um, cross comparisons between the two disciplines. Um, but on, on to the data. So there are many moving parts when you're looking at intergenerational mobility. Uh, we fix uh, our point of departure is, is the following uh, simple fact that Statistics Sweden has available to it um, registers on incomes um, for essentially everybody who in that particular year um, appears in, in, in the income registers of any sort from 1968 to 2018. Um, the, so about 50 or specifically 51 years um, of data. There's some limited income data available from registers from 1960 to 1966. Um, we're not using those data here. I'll, you, if you want to ask about it later on, you can, but, but the, the, our point of departure is, is 1968 and 2018. Um, what we do is to follow what has become the convention in, in, in the relative mobility literature and economics um, to take um, average income across um, a few years, both uh, for offspring and for the parents, and to measure income um, around the same ages for both um, offspring and their parents. So we're not looking at the causal issue of, 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 of how the resources available while you're growing up affects um, your economic outcomes as an adult. What we're instead trying to do is to try to look at um, the association or relationship um, of offspring income and parental income when those are around the same age. The idea being to, to try to capture some kind of, if not permanent income, at least some kind of um, income at a relatively stable um, economic age of persons. And there's some evidence um, that around the age of 40 is a, is a reasonably stable period of time. With that said, I do want to underline something, which is that this particular result that a few years of income around the age of 40 is a reasonably good measure of, of something that can be thought of as being permanent income. It, it actually... It, it, it is something that's been found both for the US and for Sweden, but it only applies to men and it only applies um, to factor incomes and, and earnings, labor earnings. We don't know um, if there's any such um, good point in time to measure permanent income um, for things like disposable income. And we don't know if there's such an age um, if there's such an age for women. But using this kind of focusing around, around the age 40, I think is at least has the, the benefit of, of being descriptively a, a, a point in time in which it, it seems reasonable to, to, to look at things. And much of the literature does uh, roughly uh, the same thing. We can move this age around a little bit um, but but for now, we're looking at, at 40. We take five years centered on age 40 as a measure of, of, of economic status. So, so it's essentially ages 38, 39, 40, 41, and 42. Varying the 
number of years averaged over doesn't seem to have a huge impact. So we've tried, we've done three and five and, and seven years. It doesn't affect things a lot. But with these restrictions, um, where it, it, so to speak, limits the cohorts we can look at. So our oldest parents um, are born in 1930 um, because they need to be um, 40 years old in, in 1970, which is the center years departing from 1968. And the youngest offspring are born um, in 1976. So I, I made a little mistake actually in the data. So I think the cohorts tend to be cut off at 1975, but that's not so. But but with this, th this is in principle uh, a limitation of, of what we can, can look at. Now, apart from incomes, um, which specific incomes it is, I'll, I'll say more about it in a minute. But we have some other pieces of information as well. We, we have information on their marital status in, in each year. We have information of, of, of their children. Um, and this, of course, applies both to parent and offspring. And we also know their place of, of birth, including uh, if it's not in Sweden. We know this both for the parents and for the, for the children. And we also have information about educational attainment and so on, but we're actually not, not making use of that. Um, we have from the Swedish birth register information um, about kinship. And for the results we're showing today and in, for what we've done for the Swedish Economic uh, Council, we're using biological kinship. Um, we could be looking at, at adoptions as well. That turns out not to matter from um, earlier research that we've looked at, the, the, but, but this kind of um, it, it simplifies matters to, to, to focus on, on this thing. And our data are based on population registers, uh, both in the sense that, that that's where they actually stem from. Um, but, but also importantly, these are population data. So we haven't actually used a sample at all, but, but essentially we're using everybody who, who meets the criteria that we, we, we place, um, who was available in, in the registers at, at the time in, in Sweden. So I, I'm, I'm actually not showing any confidence intervals or standard errors or so on because um, we're, we're looking at, at, at the population here. Now, um, in research on, on income distribution, um, Things like when the OECD publishes research on on on, on the distribution of uh, on on economic inequality across time, the a version of of the table I show here is is being used as a basis for doing things. First of all, there are different income components. I've simplified this quite a bit from from the actual, but all the same, um, with a focus on what we actually look at. So um, and also there's there's the way the table is constructed implies a kind of temporal sequence to things, but that's not entirely um, accurate, of course, because essentially we, we, we use here and a lot of the research does use is annual um, information on, on all of these different components. But, but the point of departure is, is earnings, earnings consisting both of, of wages and salaries um, and self-employment income. So that's, that's earnings. Um, we have, if you add capital income to earnings, you get factor incomes. So we look at both earnings and factor incomes. We don't look at capital incomes on their own, but 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 rather we, in a sense, accumulate. Then you add transfers, both private and uh, to the extent that they enter the registers, and add importantly social transfers um, to factor incomes, subtract direct taxes, and you get disposable income. But this is all um, for um, a specific member of the family or household is called this, this person A. So this gives us three personal income cons components. Uh, labor income, labor earnings, I think the labels vary a little bit. Then we have um, factor income, and then we have disposable income, all at the personal level. But then we aggregate um, within the household or what we have access to is in fact the family defined for tax purposes and we get um, household disposable income that's 
there in the last column. Of course, and this we will do in the future, we, we can also, of course, aggregate within the household also these these subcomponents or the cumulative parts, the earnings, factor incomes, and so on. I think that's an important um, uh, thing to do in part because we kind of like to know um, when 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 things happen. I'll, I'll highlight why this is potentially very important in a minute. But once we've aggregated disposable income, we also adjust the income um, for household needs. And what we do is that we use information on marital status and, and the number of children to, to work out um, uh, the equivalent number of adults use a reasonably standard way of, of, of um, creating a, the equivalent number of adults and divide household or family disposable income by by that number to 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 give us um, what what most what, what in fact income inequality research tends to look at. So, sorry, um, about yes. about that. do you divide by the number of people in the household or the number of parents in the household? We divide by the number of persons in the household. Oh, um, okay. we, that, that's so. So the standard practice is to. Um, so essentially, you, you work out um, the first adult is one, the second adult tends to be somewhere between zero and one, um, and then children come in with a weight which is less than the second adult. Um, the Luxembourg Income Study, for instance, uses the square root of family size, so adults mm -hmm. and children are created the same. Um, the European Union uses a weight of 0 0.5 uh, for all additional persons who are 15 or older and 0 0.3 for uh, children, I think, um, I think we take, I think we use the square root scale. So essentially, the equivalent number of adults is is the square root of of family size. Um, now, so but so we focus on the on the on, on earnings factor income, personal disposable income, and disposable household income, which has been adjusted for family size. We average across five years around age 40 for both parents and offspring. And one additional thing we, we do in the numbers I'm showing here is that we limit the parent offspring age difference, uh, which of course is in fact, the age at which the child was born to 20 to 30 years. Um, if we don't have that limitation, it doesn't affect things a lot, but for our early cohorts, um, this, this uh, matters. And, and from the robustness checks we've done until now with respect to these Choices the number of years averaged over and parent offspring age difference. It doesn't seem that this matters very much for the changes across time we observe. Um, but this, this, so this is uh, the first of a large number of graphs. The most of which I won't be. I, I'll probably be be skipping them a lot. So I've grouped people into um, two-year age cohorts. So it's the first one is those born in 1950 and 1951. The last is those uh, born in 1976, somewhat um, un stupidly. I, the, the label on that last one is, is missing, but that's a single, um, single age cohort. Um, what these show is the dots are median um, ages uh, when the parents are born and the bars denote the minima and the maximum of those. And what you can see here is that for the most part, um, the age range of the parents um, moves pretty closely with, with uh, the birth cohort of the children, except in the early years. So it stabilizes um, for the cohorts in 58, 59. So before that, the age range, the parents are drawn from a narrower um, range, range of birth years which also means that their incomes are measured um, at a narrower uh, range of calendar years, of course. But all the same, we once we've fixed the age range um, uh, after 1960, the um, it, it stabilizes. And, and when, when we have both, we've taken the average of the parents' ages um, as our measure. So um, this is one version of how what inequality looks like in Sweden across from the late 1960s um, to 2018. Um, 
Labor income, factor income, and disposable personal income are all measured for the person that, um, only, whereas disposable household income is is measured as um, essentially the family's disposable household income, which for the most part is is that for a for a married couple, taking into account the equivalent number of adults. And and as is reasonably well known, is that inequality in Sweden declined um, from a very much higher level than is observed today uh, till about, um, depending on exactly what it is you're looking, but if we're looking at disposable household income, declined to its lowest uh, level around 1980 um, and then started to increase um, again, but is now in the um, uh, in, in the past few years, it's been um, going upwards um, slowly, but but is still at a level which is um, lower than it was before. But if you look at disposable household income, the level is in fact not that far from from where it started in the 1970s. We've tried to make the income concept we're looking at reasonably comparable across time, but there are jumps. Uh, one substantial jump occurs in all series um, in the early 1990s when there was a major tax reform in Sweden, which also changed the definition of of, of how the tax system registers a lot of incomes. Um, the fact that we average across multiple years takes to some extent care of that problem. But these um, are annual incomes. This is for the somewhat oddly selected um, cross-section of ages of 31 to 68, um, which is data-driven because the, that's, the, that, that's the broadest possible range of ages for which we can measure incomes in, in, in all of the different years. But again, these patterns don't vary tremendously um, depending on what we see. We will refer back to this because we've also tried, I'll show it at the end, well, Let's see if I have time. I've, we've tried to do a little bit of counterfactual analysis to try to figure out um, what happens if we uh, fix either inequality or, or uh, income growth, um, income levels to be fixed across time. So this um, inequality in the cross-section is, is of relevance for, for that also. Um, now, those who um, read the press, may be familiar with, with what came to be known as the elephant curve, um, a figure that Branko Milanovic drew on the basis of his compiling of global inequality to, to look at changes in real incomes um, across the global distribution of income, a so-called growth incidence curve. What it does is that it, it looks for uh, in cross-sectional data at how real incomes uh, change across all the points in the distribution of income here, measured by the percentile of, of income distribution, essentially um, measures average growth across the years, across the distribution of income. And what I want to highlight here is that depending on which of these income concepts we're looking at, um, you either have reasonably pro-poor growth or pro-low income growth in that for low income percentiles, average annual growth rates of incomes tend to be quite high relative to say the, the, the median growth rate of, of around um, between one and a half and 2%. And then we have at the very top, a little bit higher growth. But if we look at what, what is one of the, what we think the really important economic standard, disposable household income, we see that across this period, um, real income growth has in fact been pro-rich in Sweden in that the, this average growth rate is, is positively correlated with position in, in income distribution. But I'll, I'll be coming back to this also later on. Um, I'll skip in the interest of time. Now this repeats, this is a repeat of the cross-sectional data with all the income concepts drawn in one. What I what we do here is that we, we now look in each panel at each of the income concepts separately and plot both the cross-sectional series 
that were in the previous graph, but also um, inequality in the in the five year average measured at, at age 40 um, for um, our longitudinal data. These are the data that we'll later be looking at. We see that we, we do have the same uh, steep decline in inequality and we even have the, the kind of beginning of, of the increase in inequality again. But depending on which concept we're looking at, um, we, we, we tend to, to some extent, miss the uptick in, in inequality that takes place um, in the cross-sectional data. In, in labor income, we see, a, in, in fact, a substantial decline in the others. The decline is, is somewhat less. Um, but but this the correspondence to the cross section is greater when we limit ourselves to the three year means. But but the five year means is what we're using here. Now, so to get to the to the actual results, I'll I'll start by showing um, some results on relative mobility. We do this in part because first of all we think of course relative mobility matters, but also these are reasonably familiar with with um, to to those who have been following this literature for some while, but they also do highlight some of the issues that, that, that we think are important here. So this is um, the kind of thing for which most is known about intergenerational mobility. Um, it's essentially the, the regression coefficient in a regression of the logarithm of offspring income on the logarithm of parental income, the, the so-called elasticity. This is the kind of stuff that Regression analysis started with um, in the 1880s by Francis Galton, who regressed offspring height on parental height measured in inches. Um, this is for pairs of fathers and sons and looking at, at labor earnings. There's a perhaps surprisingly um, steep increase across the early cohorts here, but after that, uh, matters stabilized. The, magnitude of these coefficients from 1960 and onwards is around uh, 0 0.26, 0 0.25 to 0.27. This is in the ballpark that we should be expecting um, um, across time to begin with. Um, um, as these things come and go across countries, this is a lower number than in, in, in most of the world, including um, uh, much of Europe and and. North America, it's higher, in fact, than in, in other Nordic countries, but all the same, uh, roughly in, in the same ballpark. Um, so, but, but if we look at um, the elasticity um, across uh, parents and children, that is, we take, um, we aggregate um, mother and father income, Take the, take the mean, in fact, of those. And we look at the child's um, disposable household income. We see that um, the level is, is very different, although for the two last cohorts, um, the, um, it's, it's very close, in fact, to what we find for earnings. But we have a, a, we have a little bit of a dip in between, but, but still across time, you might claim that there's more um, of a trend for in, in, increased um, persistence. But if we now plot all of the pairs we have, that is, we have in the columns both parents and then we have fathers and mothers, and then we have all persons on the first row, and then we have daughters and sons. We see that the kind of assessment you make across the different um, income concepts um, and aggregation units um, affect the assessment of trends quite substantially. Um, and in particular, what appears to be the case, and this is going to be much of the theme here, um, the personal income concepts um, look very similar. That is, they move quite similarly. But once we took, take family circumstances uh, into account, in particular the circumstances um, uh, family circumstances of the offspring and look at disposable household income, things look uh, quite different. Um, and even the relative uh, mobility patterns, either um, 
display a, a relative degree of stability or hugely increased persistence, depending on, on, on which of these, in fact, you're looking at. This is not an artifact of using the elasticity, although there's probably more variation looking at the elasticity. This is looking at rank correlations, which, which standardize um, the marginal distributions um, fully. But we have a little bit of the same. We have um, the other, the personal, person-based income concepts um, move much more closely together, whereas um, household-based measures, um, the disposable household income thing looks quite different. And, and the, the, it says top, the northwest corner where we have both parents and, and look at all persons. In, in a sense, I think this is the most welfare relevant. Of course, we should count everybody and we should look at, at the economic standard um, of both when offspring are adults and the economic standard of the parents. And, and here, um, for that measure, there's um, relatively stable dependence um, or the relatively stable correlation between parents and children. Um, what about absolute mobility? Well, one way to look at that is to look at what fraction of children have an income which is at least as high as that of their parents. That's the number for earnings that um, has been plotted in this figure. And uh, we have it separately for sons and, and daughters. What we see here is um, that for the early cohorts, these numbers were, were quite low um, between 30 and, and 60%. with um, the daughter-father pairing uh, being substantially lower, but, but the increase across time being reasonably uh, quite closely the same in both. And by the time we reach the final cohorts, um, around 85% of the sons and, and almost 70%, uh, between 65 and 70% of the daughters have, have an income that's, that's at least as high as that of their fa father. But that's for labor income. Um, for disposable household income, we have similarly across all of these cohorts an increasing trend, but at a very much higher level, um, starting off around 80% uh, for both uh, sons and, and, and daughters and landing at, at around 95% and also reaching that constant level at, at, at a much um, uh, for earlier cohorts. And again, if we um, take all four different income concepts and all possible parent pairings um, of, of um, offspring with, with parents, we see that, that uh, we have a very varied uh, picture. So um, depending on, on your income concept, it seems like there's um, your income concept and the specific relationship you're looking at, you either have a, a substantial increase uh, in the fraction of children who have an income that's higher than that of their parents, um, or things look in fact reasonably stable um, across time. So we, we, the kind of maximum here is that, that um, just over 20% of, of daughters born in 1952 to 1953 had incomes that were higher than than their fathers at, at uh, measured in factor incomes, um, uh, but by by uh, 1974 and 1975, uh, more than 60 percent had a higher income versus um, that's 80 to to about 90, 95 percent for disposable household income. So it really does matter um, exactly what you mean by parents, exactly what do you mean by offspring, and exactly what do you mean by income level? I've, I've got a lot more. Uh, well, actually, let's um, look at, at something more. Now, what, one is that one thing you can look at is, well, what if it's not only income? What if also position and in income distribution matters? So here we've looked at 
at both having a higher income rank than your parent um, and or having a higher income than your parent. Of course, that's a two times two matrix of which we can look at. At the margins, um, the green triangles um, are the higher incomes. Um, the red dots are higher ranks, and then we have kind of lower R, higher Y, and, and, and so on as well. And on the, on the rank-based stuff, things look relatively more stable, um, and the income-based um, stuff we, we already saw earlier. We, we have in the appendix to the report we've written for the Economic Council Review also mothers here. We're looking at both, uh, only both parents and, and, and fathers also. I'm going to skip a number of tables now, um, a number of figures, I'm sorry. This separates, let's see now which one I mislabeled this one. This is mislabeled, it's, it's actually the parents, whether the parent is foreign born or not. I'm sorry, that's, the, the title here is wrong. But the legends are right. So, so the the solid lines um, are for parents um, born abroad, and the dotted lines um, are for parents born in Sweden. And by and large, um, the foreign born um, the difference uh, to Swedes is isn't all that huge. Um, so there's a little bit of a tendency for a uh, parent born abroad to have a uh, slightly lower uh, mobility, perhaps somewhat surprisingly, but all the same, they, they follow each other quite closely. This is now for offspring uh, born abroad, and there's perhaps a little bit more um, difference here. So, um, so, so here we contrast all with, with a child born abroad. Um, we have on labor income, reasonably similar patterns for disposable household income. Um, we have more income mobility for those, uh, for everybody than those where the child has been born abroad. That's a little surprising, but, but that's all the same what we do get. Um, we've also looked at this depending on, on the region of birth for the child. There's of course, at, at, at the, at the region, at Lens, Nivor, um province, perhaps. Um, I think it translates to, but who knows. And we see that there's a little bit of variation. There's persistence in these series, um, but also some movement on, on, on how the different uh, provinces um, make do, but, but the overall trend is reasonably similar to what we find for everybody. So we don't think this um, is where much of the action um, is. But let's now uh, take a quick look at, at our counterfactual analysis. So we've, we've done two different kinds of counterfactual um, analyses. I think this needs to be developed somewhat. The top row here is, is the realized pattern. So these are, again, the fraction who have a higher income than their parents and the columns show the different income concepts, labor income, factory income, disposable personal income, and disposable household income. The middle row, we've taken away economic growth. So essentially we've, we've made income level in all cohorts to have the average it had in, in 2015. Um, and then we've recalculated um, all of our, uh, our numbers. And the bottom row, again, fixes the Gini coefficient, or in fact, fixes the distribution um, around the actual average um, to be at its constant 2015 um, level. And exactly what you get from this um, may or may not uh, be tremendously insightful. At this point, our assessment is that that we can't really say that it's it's entirely the mean or it's entirely the um, the distribution that accounts for the changes across time we observe because while the fixing the mean for instance um, 
shifts the level of these uh, curves down by quite a bit. Um, the overall shape of the trends doesn't change all that much. Um, fixing inequality makes the de development somewhat more compressed than they are uh, e either in, in reality or with a constant mean. But, but again, um, the fact that, that you need to be very specific about what income concept exactly it is you're looking at remains as does, I think, the broad uh, pattern of the trends. Um, now, so Marcus, I think it's yes. sort of time to wrap up a little bit. To leave uh, I'll, I'm, I'm get, getting to the end here now. I'll, I'll say, can I do a couple of more minutes because then I'll, I'll actually be done. Sure. Go yeah. Ahead. So, so as, as I've underlined a not large number of times, um, what we learn from these absolute um, comparisons is, of course, related to a, to a very long literature in economics um, going back many years about what kind of comparisons you can make overall of, of incomes across um, um, across any dimension, including persons and, and so on. It's a literature that's alive and well, as 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 Gustav uh, well knows. Um, but but I remember reading in in, in Amartya Sen's um, collected works papers like. Uh, uh, r real national income um, from from the 70s, and I'm sure it started a lot long before that, including, of course, the whole issue of, of how to measure national accounts and so on. And in fact, the absolute the, the issue about absolute comparisons of, of income levels is 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 it it doesn't really change very much in character if you take if you take the intergenerational um, perspective on it. I'll. I'll make a few reflections and, and then I'll, I'll, I'll end by showing, showing an, an, another graph. One is that we usually think of the unit of well-being in welfare economics to be the individual, but to get anywhere in the welfare economics of mobility, um, you essentially slip into looking at the uh, dynastic line, which tends to be the male dynastic line, even if it's mostly restricted to fathers and sons, that's still a dynastic analysis. Um, uh, so this is the kind of thing which, which Atkinson and Bourguignon look at and so on. It, it seems to me, I'm, I'm not now speaking for Jesper, but, but for myself, that the intelligible, appro intelligible approach, if you're looking at, at the welfare economics of this, is to tilt, treat the individual as the relevant uh, unit for, for well-being analysis, but to evaluate um, their well-being with reference to uh, parental living standards. So the parental living standards can be thought of as the reference point for an assessment of individual well-being. But all the same, the, the distance you need to travel from, from um, um, having fixed price earnings and factor incomes to actually comparing living standards across generations is, is very long. And, and in fact, we've only uh, scratched the surface and, and disposable household income is, is just uh, one stop along that way. Now, um, I'll end here. You remember the elephant curve um, thing or the growth incident curve I showed before. Those were, so to speak, anonymous. That is, um, we looked at, at, at growth in different points in the distribution. These correspond to what we call the anonymous here, the first row of of figures, these show now not the relative um, income change, but but the real fixed income change um, across points in the parental generation. And we see, for instance, that um, the 56, 57 cohort had a much smaller change in their incomes, uh, regardless of income concept than the 1974 and 75 cohort, but, but that absolute income change was quite concentrated in the top. The bottom row shows um, parent-child pairs. So this shows the average difference in incomes of, of parents and children um, at different points in the distribution. So these are non-anonymous um, uh, changes in incomes. And here we see that these um, um, are negatively sloped and, and in fact quite substantially so for factor incomes, less so for disposable income. So so the better off um, your parents 
um, the smaller uh, the absolute income change you enjoy um, across time, and 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 often um, it's a decline in in income. And so here's then the, the the question in a sense is this: which of these, the top row or the bottom row, is more relevant for an analysis of of well-being? And I I think um, I'll end by saying that that it it seems it's unclear to me if my primary concern should be to how our incomes have developed relative um, to this reference point. Um, it seems like a variation of this old joke ascribed, I've heard ascribed to Oscar Wilde, who, who essentially, which alludes to the poor utility generating capacity of the well-to-do, that he's miserable unless he can have champagnes and oysters every day for breakfast. I'll end there. So that's it. Thank you very much. And uh, that was really, really interesting. And uh, there's going to be lots of questions. We're going to tell you how to run the, how we're running this uh, question and answer uh, part. Uh, you can write your questions into the chat function. That's how we use this. And if you want to ask a question, you should write that in the chat. And as, since we are a mix of researchers from different fields, it's good if you tell us your area of study so we can mix questions from different areas. Uh, so you write your name and area of study, for example, Joe philosophy. And then we also have these follow-up questions. So you can write follow-up to, and then the person asks the questions. And follow-ups are, are taken before new questions, but they should really be follow-ups. Uh, and when it's your turn, I will ask you to, I will call upon you and you can put on uh, your uh, microphone. And uh, I will first actually give the word to uh, Per Engsel. Per, are you with us? I am here, yes. Um, thank you. Thank you for this incredibly rich and insightful um, presentation. It's actually quite similar to ongoing work that I'm doing with Karina Mood, who couldn't make it today, unfortunately. She sends her apologies. Um, so my question was with the cohorts trends and especially the, the early cohorts that you say. There. So you say you measure income around age 40. Uh, and you start measuring it at 68. So these early cohorts, the parents would have been would have needed to be in their early 20s when they had children, right? Um, so, so I was wondering how much we should trust um, the the quite dramatic trends that you had in the early um, cohorts, and also um, I, they struck me as curious since they seem to um, be opposed to um, a lot of other things that we know. So, for example, there's um, the paper that you wrote, Marcus, with um, um, with Anders Björklund and Matthew Lindquist, I think, with brother correlations that go down quite dramatically um, in in the in in these years or slightly earlier. Um, and I also have work looking at occupational income um, using historical census data, where we also find a dramatic decrease in the elasticity um, from the early. Uh, 20th century until the mid 20th century. So yeah, sh should we trust those trends that you find there in the beginning of your period? Um, I I think they need to be taken with a grain of salt. So I so the so the distribution of the parent-child age difference stabilizes from 1960 and onwards um, by what we do. We can we can explore it uh, a little more. So we we can make use of the 1960 to 66 date, but for a limited number of income concepts and explore it somewhat more. But the trend is reasonably steep from, from the 1960 and so on cohort onwards. So the, the, the same pattern more or less applies. It's just that it, it, it looks particularly um, dramatic for, for those early cohorts. I mean, I mean, one easy way to test this would be to um, restrict on the same um, age at birth, right, for all cohorts. And, and then we could see whether, whether that makes a big difference. But I mean, it would be really cute. I think you have a real puzzle if these uh, trends hold up because they seem to contradict so much um, of, of what we know from, um, yeah, from, from other sources. Yes, true. And I, I this bad point, I, um, I was busy trying to sort our, our uh, results. So I, I did huge injustice. In fact, it, uh, the, the, there are several 
groups of researchers who have written about Swedish absolute mobility, including Per with Karina, but also also a few other authors. And and the fact that I didn't mention them in in, yeah. in my slide on literature should should not be taken as, as no, anything. No, no. No problem. Yeah. Actually, we study relative mobility exclusively in the in the paper I'm thinking of. So uh, oh, okay. we'll, we'll we'll share that at some point when we when we have a draft of each. Yeah. Uh, thank yes. you. But 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 thanks for that that remark. I'll, and we, so again, it, uh, easing the restriction, having no restriction. So the results we showed were 20 to 30. The range is still large. The so of course we will in, in the end uh, restrict exactly because we have we have enough data to to do it, but. But but it's a point well taken. Good. Thank you. Very good. Martin Kolk. Martin? You're on mute. That's strange. I have unmuted right. my... Yes. Uh, you hear me now? No. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Th th that was lots of interesting results. Uh, my, my question is maybe a, a little bit related to to Per's question. So, uh, right, you you took parent-child links that were between age twenty and thirty, right? So I think for like men, that's really high-income men. You then only select like forty percent or so of of the parent-child links. I think, which and and it might be changing a little bit over time. So I'm, I'm wondering if that restriction is a little bit, if you would need a little bit wider age range, at least for in particular for the father to child links. Uh, we, we originally had no restriction at all, but 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 in doing the descriptives, we discovered, of course, the self-evident thing that that. By having no restriction, we in fact, of course, have have a very restricted age age uh, at birth originally, and then it, it eases up towards the end. Um, so that that's where we place the restriction. There, there's no from 1960 and onwards. There's no difference in the results with or without the restriction. So, which is and, and again, it's it, it's a serious question um, and needs to be addressed by by having the same restriction. Uh, throughout, uh, but but it doesn't really it doesn't seem to be changing matters uh, all that much. Okay, so 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 that's that's nice to hear. But even if you have the the same restriction over time, right? You still have a increasing trend of uh, age at first birth. So you might be indirectly selecting no, 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 of uh, course, different yeah. parts of the distribution also when you yes. fix fi yes. fix the age range. So yeah. so that's. But yeah, it, it, yeah. If, if if it looks good with robustness checks, you're probably yeah. on top of it. Okay, uh, actually, I'm next on the list, so this would be a more flippant, more general question. So I, I just want a little bit more uh, why this mobility measures that you're getting a very interesting Russell, but what question you think they are relevant for? I mean, you mentioned that in the beginning and depends on what question we're asking. Is it because, uh, I mean, some people think that uh, it is worse if you have a class society, it's worse if the same people, so say, they stay, they, it's predetermined by uh, who your parents were. And according to some ideologies, that's worse than uh, uh, than uh, uh, if people kind of go up and down and there's an opportunity for the self-made man to say, is that's why it's interesting? And it, in connection to that, I, I, I just wanted to know why, I mean, when you looked at the parental income, if I understand correctly, you looked at the average or the mean. And I wonder why that is more interesting than looking at, let's say the top income of the, of the family, or maybe the bottom income of the family. And, and, uh, and, and then I guess when you treat the offsprings, you of course treat them as individuals. So they come in, uh, you look at each, uh, if there's three children, you're going to look at, uh, well, in your graphs, going to show somebody got a higher income, somebody got a lower income. They're not treated as a, a kind of average there, I guess, but I might have missed something. Um, no, this last one, yes, we, we treat every child as, as, we relate every child to, to their parents, um, regardless of, of whether they're... Um, if they're multiple, they, they, they just count as unrelated individuals. Um, so let's, first of all, of course, we, we, we've done this because we were asked to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> but but I'm so I think there are two ways. There are different ways to think why intergenerational relationships are of importance. One is the causal question. So suppose, imagine a Sweden which didn't give child allowances to families with children. Would that uh, adversely impact um, the incomes of, of, of the offspring of these families as adults? That's a, a causal kind of question. Now that's, in a sense, that's the kind of question all of people have, have in mind. That's the kind of question we're not interested in, not here at least. I mean, it's an interesting question, but it's, it's not my main concern. Um, a second way to approach this is that it's just interesting to know how, how close does the apple fall from the tree? And it, it turns out this, this drives many people's interest. They, they just, they think it's an interesting fact to know about, um, the world. Um, it, it's not an uh, entirely unimportant fact. So for instance, Gary Becker wrote in, in 1978, a paper where he reviewed a lot of the intergenerational literature on, on economic resources, including in fact wealth and concluded the correlation was very low, which he took both as indicating that the particular theory he was he was uh, proposing in that paper um, was uh, almost certainly right on the one hand, and also essentially saying that that concern um, for intergenerational mobility is misplaced. Uh, so that's the second. A, a third, and this is what I've spent, what I'm very interested in. If you take today's, say, Swedish society, to what extent um, does do differences in family background account uh, for the differences we observe? And one way to think of that is what's, what's the R square of family background? That is what fraction of the variance of current day persons um, can be returned to their family background or, or say their parental income? And that tends to be the kind of question I'm interested in because if, 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 the, if the fraction explained of current variation is 100%. That essentially says that where you end up is predetermined by where you're born. If, um, as it turns out, um, it's on the order of, of 4%, it says that, well, it looks like we have a reasonably open society. And this is the kind of thing that, that, that this is why I'm interested in looking at how important family background is. It turns out there are better ways to capture that that they're looking at intergenerational relationships, um, but people tend to be most interested in intergenerational relationships. And I, I think this, this question of the, so the papers by Chetty, and the paper I cited, in fact, is, is, is labeled, uh, the fading American dream because they have a declining trend in, in the fraction of parents who, who earn more than their parents. Um, and I, it's, it's unclear to me if, if that's an interesting issue in part because Comparing real incomes is so very, very difficult. But, but all the same, I think this is, this in a sense drives the interest in these things. Then, then the issue of, of how exactly we should be measuring things, that's, I think, an open question. But, but again, if, if our concern for cross-sectional distribution is related to what we think are the consumption possibilities available to persons, then I think the intergenerational analysis that's related to this should should look at at the evolution of of the same thing, and here, and that's why. So I'm. It's essentially the the the, the, the a similar thing for how we measure the offspring living standards that we I'm measuring the the or we're measuring the the parental um, parental resources. Uh, yeah, okay, so, so so maybe that's why I just missed something in your talk. So the idea you want to look at, so say the disposable income, for example, of the family when you have the kids there, and then you compare that with the disposable income of the individuals at age 40. Is, is that the idea? Yes. Well, well no, not, 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 not only. So, we, so, we, so we're focusing on disposable income of the offspring when they're 40, disposable yeah. household income when they're 40. And then we relate it 
to the disposable income of the parents when they were 40. Exactly. So we're, not voting and having the... so, so we're trying to assess the extent to which we're comparing the living standards of the offspring at a stable age with the living standard of the parents when they're at the same, what we think might be the same stable age. It's, of course, a complicated issue because what counts as a stable age can wander um, yeah. across time as well. Yeah, I shouldn't hog the time because that was also my other questions. So I wondered why you didn't go for a lifetime income or some proxy for lifetime income. Well, well, so how I gather that if you look at 40, that might uh, differ how, so say if that's a stable income, it might differ with class and occupation. It, it might, that's true. But we, we choose age 40 because we know that a multi-year average around age 40 is at least for one income concept and for men, a good proxy for permanent income. We, we can't take lifetime income because it would be very difficult to do. I mean, we, we have 50 years of income, which is um, close to unheard of, uh, but it's still a lifetime. So, so we, I, I, I want to do this. Before. I've been doing this for 30 years. Um, <laughs> I, I, I do want to get some answers before I'm dead. Uh, so, yeah, I see. But it might be interesting. It might be robust to it. It might not make a difference if you look at 40. It, 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 it might. It, 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 we can, of course, explore that to some extent. That, 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 and and well in future research. Yeah, no, that's it. There was a follow up question here from Joe. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, so, Marcus, I just wanted to ask a little bit about this. Uh, sometimes you mentioned standards of life, and sometimes, uh, as just now, you mentioned, you know, the consumption possibilities that families have. And so, I guess, with the quality of life kind of welfare um, thought in mind, I wanted to ask a little bit about uh, welfare benefits, like what you receive back from the state for your taxes. Um, because I guess it occurred to me that you, you mentioned at various points changes in taxes because of their impact on, on income. Um, but uh, if there's significant changes in what you're receiving from the state, then that significantly impacts on on how your life is going. Uh, now, I don't know enough about the history of Sweden in this uh, in this time, but it occurs to me at least in the 2000s, you might worry about uh, what's happening in those changes. So, yeah, any, any of your thoughts on that? So w what we do capture are things that count as income. Um, the, the, so public transfers, as mm. they're defined, we do capture. What we don't capture is the value of public services. Now, so the, this, the table I showed with the earnings and, and so on, which ended at disposable income, should continue with a couple of rows, one of which is the value of public services, but the other is, is um, um, indirect taxes, essentially for, for the most part, value-added taxes, mm. to, to arrive at a we, we could call it augmented disposable income. And, and we're missing both of these things, but of course, both the public services provided so, 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 and indirect taxes collected are, are not reflected in disposable income. That's what I, I kind of alluded to this when I said that the disposable income is just one stop of, on, on the way because what you'd want to do is to, to take into account both of these. And I didn't say this at any point, but of course, this is one of the reasons I think that that these, even, even if we'd solve the problem of real income comparisons in principle, we'd still be faced with the practical problem that, first of all, we don't have the, we can't adjust our incomes uh, for indirect taxes, which are mostly reflected in the level and and. Uh, composition of, of consumption and that changes tremendously across this time period and we also have uh, we could do some imputations about the value of public services but that's a hard problem how are you how, how do you value child care services what's the value of of a year in in high school what's the value of well, the police and security what's the value of of of, of this or that what's the value of of being able to get a liver transplant, which you can at the end of the period, but not at the beginning, and so on. It's um, so again. I, this is one of the reasons why I think these kind of real living standard comparisons are, are that that I, at best I like to use absolute in inverted commas because I I think it's it's such a complicated um, issue. So, but but to finish a very long. And rambling answer to your question, 
of what the public sector provides to the population in terms of 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 welfare services and transfers we capture the services but not the ser- I, I sorry we don't capture the services but we do capture the transfers yeah okay thanks Paul of Abenard, what about pensions are they in there uh, pensions are in there okay so so that uh, and anything that counts as income is 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 in there yeah is it in there when it so say paid out or is it in there as a as a saving even though you can't that, that, that changed dramatically um with the tax reform of the 1990s yes Spain knows a lot more about this than so I'll I'll blame him for my lack of of knowledge on this but but it it it's it's in there sometimes but not always but but of course at age 40 um Yeah. Receipts of pensions isn't all that central, but but this issue of payment out, of course, matters to some extent. That's true. Maybe Jasper would like to comment us if Jasper is still with us, which I think he is. I'm I'm still here, but it it's going to be too long if I start commenting on on this. So I should I think we should you know take other questions. You and I can talk okay. more about that later. Yeah, details. Okay, so the next is Ulla Hammar from economics. Ulla? Yes, hi. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, very interesting, of course. So this uh, this actually relates to the, <laughs> to the last questions here, but from a more, more technical point of view, maybe. So uh, I, I think it was very interesting to see these different patterns in the for the different income concepts. Uh, but I, I was thinking here, especially like you you mentioned that you tried to standardize those, but So when it comes to the to the disposable income, which is maybe the most relevant here, how much do you actually capture the the transfers that are in these late sixties and seventies? Because I think there are there were a lot of transfers that were not taxable, so I think they would not be in the registers. Do you still sort of impute them or or yeah, how do you handle these? And and also related just how you handle the capital gains, which are more observable in the in the end of the period, if they are in there or not. Yeah, we uh, essentially rely on statistics, Sweden definitions of, of disposable income. So so to the extent they don't, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that, that they miss all non-taxable transfers. Um, but what we do with capital gains is that we, doing they were registered first of all they measured in somewhat different ways before and after i mean across time but especially before and after the 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 tax reform um we include them in factor income we don't we we so we the period when they were included in earnings we subtract them from that so to the extent that they measured at all they appear in factor income um we think or at least hope that the averaging across multiple years um takes care of some of the variability associated with with capital gains and the fact that we don't see the factor income measure jump about a lot i think attests a little bit um to that but but it's it's comparability across time there's no question that that that's um a complicated issue and and the, the extent to which we miss transfers early on i'll i'll need to look into we can do a little bit of imputing um but but to a limited extent so but but thanks that's a are you happy to answer then we uh, go to par again paring cell yes thank you um so i also have a, que- a related question about comparability over time especially for absolute mobility i could i mean you've mentioned the the public services the access to public services might differ But I was also wondering about this argument that you know the quality of goods may differ in ways that are not picked up by uh, inflation adjustments, especially like that we have access to all these like um, digital goods and services that are nominally free, right? So they don't uh, factor into income adjustments. Um, the the should, should we should we think about that somehow? I I, I it it it's. Without doubt, it belongs to a long list of reasons why it's. I think very hard to make the case that a hundred thousand crowns in 2018 is 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 worth the same as a hundred thousand crowns in fixed price terms in 1970. So I, I I think this is an important 
issue also. I think what what counts, I remember when I was reading that there was something called the Boskin Commission in, in, the, in the US in the early 1990s, which tried to look into that there was a debate about whether or not um, inflation was was well measured. It's it's a politically important question in the US because pensions, uh, social security um, is affected tremendously by how inflation is measured. And, and I remember reading a report on the Boskin report, which, which um, made the point about quality, which I think is an important one, but it gave the, to me at the time, startling example of how the fact that, that gas stations used to be places where you'd go and somebody would come out and fill up your car. And now you drive there and there's, there's a machine that you use your, operate yourself and then you pay by credit card in, in this thing. This was cited as a huge quality improvement, which um, I was surprised about at the time. And it, it essentially made me to think that, that what exactly it is that counts as a quality improvement, I think, is somewhat um, a matter of taste. So, for mm -hmm. instance, um, is it a, an improvement in the quality of life that we can be reached by our employers by email? at all times of the day? Um, possibly yes, and possibly no. Um, so, but, 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 but I do think that the, in, in a sense that, again, there are two quite different questions in a sense here. One is how do we take X crowns in 2018 and change it so that it, it is comparable somehow um, in 1970. That's in a sense the indexing problem. The second issue is, um, do we think that our capacity to generate economic well-being out of that sum of money is the same at those times? And of course, standard of living adjustments try to answer both questions in, in one go, and it turns out to be an extremely hard problem to solve. Um, so with the difficulty of doing this, I'm in a sense, my underlying feeling is that it's, it's not entirely clear to me that unless you, you're able to fix a substantial number of these movable parts prior to doing the analysis, it's unclear to me what, what exactly it is that we think we can learn from these so-called absolute income mobility um, comparisons. I, and and in, in a sense, Jesper and I have chosen to highlight uh, the huge variation you get by which, by which income definition and which kind of familial relationship you look at. But, but we could be um, emphasizing very different problems. Right. And I think a lot of that variation is also in the, in the famous Chetty paper, if you dig into the appendix, for example, um, adjusting for household size basically, you know, cuts the decline in half or something. And like every single kind of adjustment that they make in the appendix just um, slashes the, the decline in, in absolute mobility. But I, I was also thinking, I mean, another approach is just to ask people, right, whether they feel that they are better off in terms of, of living standards. Um, than their parents were uh, at the same age or something like that. And we, I actually did this in a paper published last year uh, with the general social survey for the same cohorts as, as in this um, chatty paper, 1940 to 1980. And it's pretty much flat and hovering between 70 and 80% um, that subjectively feel that they're upward and mobile. So I think that sort of speaks to um, the fact that there's clearly things that, that are difficult to pick up with income here. W w what they are, I mean, we can only speculate about that, but... Yeah. Thank nice. you. Yeah. Very good. Uh, there are more time for questions. Um, we have been mostly asking questions about uh, your methods. So let me ask myself a question about your results. One was that you had a slide about the growth of uh, uh, disposable income, which you said was pro-rich. And I didn't get that. It looked to me like it was pro-rich and pro-very poor. Or maybe I misunderstood it. I don't know whether you can put on that slide again. Let's, um, I almost certainly can. Let me. Um, I mean, I, I'm a Linux user, so life is always a little bit more difficult than when you are, when you are in the, but we should. So if I describe it, it looked like it was pro the people at the top and the end, uh, top and the beginning. Yes, that, but, but th those were for personal. Income. So if we, 
let me now we should get so if we let's see now if yeah, I let's there you you may be referring to this figure. Yeah. So, let me so the, the point here is that the, the, the three lines, which are very high at the low end, yeah. those are for personal incomes. The red dots are disposable yeah. household income. And those show the, the, the well, I mean, it's essentially it's, it's flat between 25 and 75, and then it's, yeah. it's increasing below that and, and increasing above, uh, above 75 percentile. Yeah. And so, and so this, pro, 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 not only pro rich but also pro poor. Or I, I am well, the personal ones are in. In fact, the personal ones are mostly pro poor, except at the very top. Mm -hmm. um, and, and of course, they're, they're very strongly um, pro poor, if you will. But from an income distribution perspective, the relevant one is disposable household income, and that's that. That's consistent with the fact. So in 2011, in in OECD is growing unequal. They pointed out that Sweden had one of the greatest increases in, in relative inequality. Um, in their table one, essentially, it is a version of, of, of this red line I have here. Good. And then a second about the result. Uh, don't you find your result, and this connects actually to Paris' question, I mean, your results were that uh, uh, the fraction of people with income higher than their parents was wasn't that surprising uh, that it was so so many so there's such a big fraction or at least I was surprised by it. But well, the, I, I, I'm not because we're, we're talking about the early 1970s to 2018, and and yeah. after all, the economy has grown quite a lot. So so yeah. it's essentially picking up this. Okay, so that's it. Uh, it's, yeah. yeah, so it's picking up the, the high growth. Yeah. Okay. What, what, what's a little bit surprising is once we get to our counterfactual analysis and fix everybody, yeah. fix the marginal distributions always to be the same, we still have some change across time. But, 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 those, but, but the, the, the pattern's the same, that is, that there's exactly. more. I never thought in your counterfactual analysis when you fix things, the pattern was the same. The pattern was the same, but the level was very different. Uh -huh. The okay. levels were lower, uh, but the pattern across time was was quite similar. But, but if you contrast that with what uh, Per reported, when people self-report, it seemed to be rather different than the rest that you are getting. Well, yes and no. I, the, the, the issue is what exactly is it they're asking? So if the question is, were, were the resources available to your household? the same as the resources available to to to, to you i it, i think the general social survey has reasonably general income kind of questions it asks about living standards but but since this is the us it's not directly comparable to uh, oh, yeah. no oh, yeah, that's a big difference of course very well uh, we still have time for more questions if anyone has a question i think we still have time am i wrong about the time uh, are we running a little bit low on time? Okay, so, oh well, Chris de Chris has a question, so I'll let him in. Yeah, so this is sort of um, a very open and general question uh, about this sort of uh, living standard comparison between parents and offsprings. How does the uh, result here compare to the results when it comes to comparing educational levels between parents and offsprings? If you know that, that um, area. I don't, but there's a fair chance that Pad Excel does know. Um, yeah, so that that has been going down. I mean, I, again, I'm thinking of the data that I looked from the US, but I'm fairly sure that this looks similar in Sweden, actually, as um, kind of educational expansion has leveled off. Of course, there are fewer and fewer um, children who get a higher education than um, than their parents. So, the, and this is this is actually the same in a, in all rich countries. So, so there is a decline there, quite a drastic one. Okay, thank you. As you expanded the educational possibilities so much, very good. Okay, uh, in that case, I think uh, this is the end of the official part of the seminar. 
if you want to chat, you can hang on, uh, uh, chat informally with the speaker and others, you can hang on. But uh, join me and uh, uh, thank the speaker very much for this very interesting talk. And as I mentioned, what is coming up? Uh, May 19, Karina Gunnarsson is giving a talk. It will be, the title is not fixed, but it will be something in criminology, I think. And then on May 26th, we have Anka Gauss. What does it mean to have a gender identity? Something you might want to know. So that's coming. So you're very welcome to that. Anyways, that's it. <laughs>